Book One of Herodotus Histories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Redman. Now, among the many rulers of this city of Babylon, whom I shall mention in my Assyrian history, who finished the building of the walls and the temples, there were two that were women. The first of these lived five generations earlier than the second, and her name was Semiramis. It was she who built dikes on the plain, a notable work. Before that the whole plain used to be flooded by the river. The second queen, whose name was Nitocris, was a wiser woman than the first. She left such monuments as I shall record, and moreover seeing that the kingdom of Media was great and restless, and Ninus itself among other cities had fallen to it, she took such precautions as she could for her protection. First she dealt with the river Euphrates, which flows through the middle of her city. This had been straight before, but by digging canals higher up, she made the river so crooked that its course now passes one of the Assyrian villages three times. The village which is so approached by the Euphrates is called Arderica. And now those who travel from our sea to Babylon must spend three days as they float down the Euphrates, coming three times to the same village. Such was this work, and she built an embankment along either shore of the river, marvellous for its greatness and height. Then, a long way above Babylon, she dug the reservoir of a lake, a little way off from the river, always digging deep enough to find water, and making the circumference a distance of fifty-two miles. What was dug out of this hole she used to embank either edge of the river, and when she had it all dug, she brought stones and made a key all around the lake. Her purpose in making the river wind and turning the hole into marsh was this, that the current might be slower because of the many windings that broke its force, and that the passages to Babylon might be crooked, and that right after them should come also the long circuit of the lake. All this work was done in that part of the country where the passes are and the shortest road from Media, so that the Medes might not mix with her people and learn of her affairs. So she made the deep river her protection, and this work led to another which she added to it. Her city was divided into two parts by the river that flowed through the middle. In the days of the former rulers, when one wanted to go from one part to the other, one had to cross in a boat, and this, I suppose, was a nuisance. But the queen also provided for this. She made another monument of her reign out of this same work when the digging of the basin of the lake was done. She had very long blocks of stone cut, and when these were ready and the place was dug, she turned the course of the river into it, and while it was filling, the former channel now being dry, she bricked the borders of the river in the city, and the descent from the gate leading down to the river, with baked bricks, like those of the wall, and near the middle of the city she built a bridge with the stones that had been dug up, binding them together with iron and lead. Each morning she laid square-hewn logs across it, on which the Babylonians crossed. But these logs were removed at night, lest folk always be crossing over and stealing from one another. Then, when the basin she had made for a lake was filled by the river and the bridge was finished, Nitocris brought the Euphrates back to its former channel out of the lake. Thus she had served her purpose, as she thought, by making a swamp of the basin and her citizens had a bridge made for them. There was a trick, too, that this same queen contrived. She had a tomb made for herself, and set high over the very gate of that entrance of the city which was used most, 
with writing engraved on the tomb, which read, If any king of Babylon in the future is in need of money, let him open this tomb and take as much as he likes. But let him not open it unless he is in need, for it will be the worse for him. This tomb remained untouched until the kingship fell to Darius. He thought it a very strange thing that he should never use this gate or take the money when it lay there and the writing itself invited him to. The reason he did not use the gate was that the dead body would be over his head as he passed through. After opening the tomb, he found no money there, only the dead body, with writing which read, If you were ever satisfied with what you had, and did not disgrace yourself seeking more, you would not have opened the coffins of the dead. Such a woman, it is recorded, was this queen. Cyrus, then, marched against Nitocris' son, who inherited the name of his father Labinetus and the sovereignty of Assyria. Now when the great king campaigns, he marches well provided with food and flocks from home, and water from the Coaspes river that flows past Susa is carried with him, the only river from which the king will drink. This water of the Coaspes is boiled, and very many four-wheeled wagons drawn by mules carry it in silver vessels, following the king wherever he goes at any time. When Cyrus reached the Gindes River on his march to Babylon, which rises in the mountains of the Mattiini and flows through the Dardanian country into another river, the Tigris, that again passes the city of Opis and empties into the Red Sea, when, I say, Cyrus tried to cross the Gindes, which was navigable there, one of his sacred white horses dashed recklessly into the river trying to get through it, but the current overwhelmed him and swept him under and away. At this violence of the river Cyrus was very angry, and he threatened to make it so feeble that women could ever after cross it easily without wetting their knees. After uttering this threat, he paused in his march against Babylon, and, dividing his army into two parts, drew lines planning out a hundred and eighty canals running every way from either bank of the Gindes. Then he organized his army along the lines and made them dig. Since a great multitude was at work, it went quickly but they spent the whole summer there before it was finished. Then, at the beginning of the following spring, when Cyrus had punished the Gindes by dividing it among the three hundred and sixty canals, he marched against Babylon at last. The Babylonians sallied out and awaited him, and when he came near their city in his march, they engaged him, but they were beaten and driven inside the city. There they had stored provisions enough for very many years, because they knew already that Cyrus was not a man of no ambition, and saw that he attacked all nations alike. So now they were indifferent to the siege, and Cyrus did not know what to do, being so long delayed and gaining no advantage. Whether someone advised him in his difficulty, or whether he perceived for himself what to do, I do not know, but he did the following. He posted his army at the place where the river goes into the city, and another part of it behind the city, where the river comes out of the city, and told his men to enter the city by the channel of the Euphrates when they saw it to be fordable. Having disposed them and given this command, he himself marched away with those of his army who could not fight. And when he came to the lake, Cyrus dealt with it and with the river, just as had the Babylonian queen. Drawing off the river by a canal into the lake, which was a marsh, he made the stream sink until its former channel could be forded. 
When this happened, the Persians, who were posted with this objective, made their way into Babylon by the channel of the Euphrates, which had now sunk to a depth of about the middle of a man's thigh. Now, if the Babylonians had known beforehand, or learned what Cyrus was up to, they would have let the Persians enter the city and have destroyed them utterly, for then they would have shut all the gates that opened on the river and mounted the walls that ran along the river banks, and so caught their enemies in a trap. But as it was, the Persians took them unawares, and because of the great size of the city, those who dwell there say, those in the outer parts of it were overcome, but the inhabitants of the middle part knew nothing of it. All this time they were dancing and celebrating a holiday which happened to fall then, until they learned the truth only too well. And Babylon, then for the first time, was taken in this way. Now at this time the Massageti were ruled by a queen called Tomiris, whose husband was dead. Cyrus sent a message with a pretense of wanting her for his wife, but Tomiris would have none of his advances, well understanding that he wanted not her, but the kingdom of the Massageti. So when guile was of no avail, Cyrus marched to the Araxes and openly prepared to attack the Massageti. He bridged the river for his army to cross, and built towers on the pontoons bridging the river. But while he was busy at this, Tomyrus sent a herald to him with this message. O king of the Medes, stop hurrying on what you are hurrying on, for you cannot know whether the completion of this work will be for your advantage. Stop and be king of your own country, and endure seeing us ruling those whom we rule. But if you will not take this advice, and will do anything rather than remain at peace, then if you so greatly desire to try the strength of the Massageti, stop your present work of bridging the river, and let us withdraw three days' journey from the Araxes, and when that is done, cross into our country. Or if you prefer to receive us into your country, then withdraw yourself, as I have said. Hearing this, Cyrus called together the leading Persians, and laid the matter before them, asking them to advise him which he should do. They all spoke to the same end, urging him to let Tomyris and her army enter his country. But Croesus the Lydian, who was present, was displeased by their advice, and spoke against it. O king, he said, you have before now heard from me that since Zeus has given me to you, I will turn aside to the best of my ability whatever misadventure I see threatening your house. And disaster has been my teacher. Now, if you think that you and the army that you lead are immortal, I have no business giving you advice. But if you know that you and those whom you rule are only men, then I must first teach you this. Men's fortunes are on a wheel, which in its turning does not allow the same man to prosper for ever. So, if that is the case, I am not of the same opinion about the business in hand as these other counsellors of yours. This is the danger if we agree to let the enemy enter your country, if you lose the battle, you lose your empire also, for it is plain that if the Massageti win, they will not retreat, but will march against your provinces. And if you conquer them, it is a lesser victory than if you crossed into their country, and routed the Massageti, and pursued them. For I weigh your chances against theirs, and suppose that when you have beaten your adversaries, you will march for the seat of Tomyris' power. And besides what I have shown, it would be a shameful thing, and not to be endured, if Cyrus the son of Cambyses should yield and give ground before a woman. 
now then it occurs to me that we should cross and go forward as far as they draw back and that then we should endeavour to overcome them by doing as I shall show. As I understand, the Massageti have no experience of the good things of Persia, and have never fared well as to what is greatly desirable. Therefore I advise you to cut up the meat of many of your sheep and goats into generous portions for these men, and to cook it and serve it as a feast in our camp providing many bowls of unmixed wine and all kinds of food. Then let your army withdraw to the river again, leaving behind that part of it which is of least value. For if I am not mistaken in my judgment, when the Massageti see so many good things, they will give themselves over to feasting on them, and it will be up to us then to accomplish great things. So these opinions clashed, and Cyrus set aside his former plan, and chose that of Croesus. Consequently he told Tomyris to draw her army off, for he would cross, he said, and attack her. So she withdrew as she had promised before. Then he entrusted Croesus to the care of his own son Cambyses, to whom he would leave his sovereignty, telling Cambyses to honour Croesus and treat him well if the crossing of the river against the Massageti should not go well. With these instructions he sent the two back to Persia, and he and his army crossed the river. After he had crossed the Araxes, he dreamed that night while sleeping in the country of the Massageti that he saw the eldest of Hystaspes' sons with wings on his shoulders, the one wing overshadowing Asia and the other Europe. Hystaspes, son of Arsames, was an Achaemenid, and Darius was the eldest of his sons, then about twenty years old. This Darius had been left behind in Persia, not yet being of an age to go on campaign. So when Cyrus awoke, he considered his vision, and because it seemed to him to be of great importance, he sent for Hystaspes, and said to him privately, Hystaspes, I have caught your son plotting against me and my sovereignty, and I will tell you how I know this for certain. The gods care for me, and show me beforehand all that is coming. Now then, I have seen in a dream in the past night your eldest son with wings on his shoulders, overshadowing Asia with the one, and Europe with the other. From this vision there is no way that he is not plotting against me. Therefore hurry back to Persia, and see that when I come back after subjecting this country, you bring your son before me to be questioned about this. Cyrus said this, thinking that Darius was plotting against him, but in fact heaven was showing him that he himself was to die in the land where he was, and Darius inherit his kingdom. So then Hystaspes replied with this, O king, may there not be any Persian born who would plot against you, but if there is, may he perish suddenly, for you have made the Persians free men instead of slaves, and rulers of all instead of subjects of any. But if your vision does indeed signify that my son is planning revolution, I give him to you to treat as you like. After having given this answer and crossed the Araxes, Hystaspes went to Persia to watch his son for Cyrus, and Cyrus, advancing a day's journey from the Araxes, acted according to Croesus' advice. Cyrus and the sound portion of the Persian army marched back to the Araxes, leaving behind those that were useless. A third of the Massageti forces attacked those of the army who were left behind, and destroyed them despite resistance. 
Then, when they had overcome their enemies, seeing the banquet spread, they sat down and feasted, and after they had had their fill of food and wine, they fell asleep. Then the Persians attacked them, killing many and taking many more alive, among whom was the son of Tomaris the queen, Spargapises by name, the leader of the Massageti. When Tomiris heard what had happened to her army and her son, she sent a herald to Cyrus with this message. Cyrus, who can never get enough blood, do not be elated by what you have done. It is nothing to be proud of if, by the fruit of the vine, with which you Persians fill yourselves and rage so violently that evil words rise in a flood to your lips when the wine enters your bodies, if, by tricking him with this drug, you got the better of my son, and not by force of arms in battle. Now then, take a word of good advice from me. Give me back my son, and leave this country unpunished, even though you have savaged a third of the Massageti army. But if you will not, then I swear to you by the Son, Lord of the Massageti, that I shall give even you, who can never get enough of it, your fill of blood. Cyrus dismissed this warning when it was repeated to him. But Spargapises, the son of the Queen Tomiris, after the wine wore off and he recognized his evil plight, asked Cyrus to be freed from his bonds, and this was granted him. But as soon as he was freed and had the use of his hands, he did away with himself. Such was the end of Spargapises. Tomiris, when Cyrus would not listen to her, collected all her forces and engaged him. This fight I judge to have been the fiercest ever fought by men that were not Greek, and indeed I have learned that this was so. For first, it is said, they shot arrows at each other from a distance. Then, when their arrows were all spent, they rushed at each other and fought with their spears and swords, and for a long time they stood fighting and neither would give ground but at last the Massageti got the upper hand. The greater part of the Persian army was destroyed there on the spot, and Cyrus himself fell there, after having reigned for one year short of thirty years. Tomiris filled a skin with human blood, and searched among the Persian dead for Cyrus' body, and when she found it, she pushed his head into the skin, and insulted the dead man in these words, Though I am alive and have defeated you in battle, you have destroyed me, taking my son by guile. But just as I threatened, I give you your fill of blood. Many stories are told of Cyrus' death. This that I have told is the most credible.